So we were at this slide, we just finished this technique where Alice has k queries, Bob has one input, and you, you could get better lower bounds. Since we log in over log log in lower bounds uh, in this linear space setting with polynomially many queries, right? So that's the, the best you can get from this uh, technique. Right. So the last result on this timeline is you can push it slightly higher to log in in the linear space uh, setting. A result of mine from 2012. Um, so let's have a look. So it's sort of a slightly different approach, yeah? Yeah. Is it always the same for, the for, for the polynomial variation problem? Yeah. Uh, I think actually the our bounds are slightly worse, but they're not too much off. Uh, I mean, is it worse in some regime with the bounds space? No, it, I think it's always a little bit worse, the upper bounds, for, this con for the polynomial variation problem. For many of the other problems we can use, the techniques on the lower bounds are tight, so they match the upper bound for, for a bunch of other problems, right, in the entire regime of trade-offs. Uh, but for this problem, it's not completely tight. It's just easier to prove the lower bounds and show the technique for this polynomial relation problem. Okay, so the last one is sort of a slightly different approach. Uh, so you just have like the high level idea. So you want to prove a lower bound, not from communication complexity, but for some sort of a compression uh, approach. So, okay. Right, so let's look at data compression. So you're given a text, and you want to compress it into a shorter text, and you want to get the original text back. And so, right, so the simple fact is that no algorithm can compress all texts. It's sort of easy right there. There's uh, this alphabet size to the y, different texts of length y. And if you want to compress them all to a text of length x, there's not enough unique text to represent all of them, right? So that's sort of a simple fact. Um, so the idea when we'll be using this incompressibility thing for data structure low bounds is to say, okay, so we start by assuming I have a magic data structure that's really, really fast. Okay, so faster than the lower bound I'm aiming to prove. And now I want to interpret any text of, say, Y symbols as an input to this data structure problem. Okay. So a text becomes uh, a polynomial, right? So we can interpret every text as a polynomial. And now I want to use this magic data structure in some clever way as a black box routine to compress this uh, input text into something smaller than the number of texts, right? So, so that's the idea. So I want to take every single text, turn it into a polynomial, build a data structure on it, and use this to compress the text. And of course, I must be able to recover the original text from this compressed representation. And if I can compress every single text of length y into something shorter, I get a contradiction here, right? There's just not enough unique, smaller text to achieve this. That's sort of the idea. Okay, so then this assumption about the magic data structure existing had to be false. So this is sort of the approach we'll be taking here instead. So that means that this inequality will be the other way around. T is at least log n. And that would be the lower bound we get out. If we assume for contradiction it has less than log n query time, we get a contradiction, then of course the query time has to be at least log n. Okay, that's, that's what we'll try to do now. And so this is sort of like an encoding proof. Uh, so let's do it for the polynomial evaluation problem. So the input is again this polynomial. We want to compress it. And the data structure problem that we're proving a lower bound for is again this evaluation problem. So we can evaluate the polynomial. And so let's assume we have this data structure for polynomial evaluation that has space s and query time faster than this log n over log s over n. Okay. Let's assume this. So we have something that's really fast. And notice, the, if you remember from the previous technique by Petrasco and Torp, there was a t sitting in here, uh, the other technique, right? So there's a t in there. So this one, for linear space, this becomes log n. These two cancel out. So it gets slightly higher bounds in the linear space case. Okay, so how do we, do, how do we use this assumption? So we want to take every single polynomial we could get its input and represent it in less than n plus 1 log p bits. And this is, of course, contradiction because there's essentially p to the n plus 1 or 2 to the n plus 1 log p different polynomials you could get its input. So they cannot all be represented by a string of le links, length less than n plus 1 log p bits. So that's the approach. And OK, so how do we do this? What's the idea? So when we want to encode the polynomial, I want to say this is technique that I'll be showing you now has appeared in, in other forms in other papers. But there, there was also this log t. So there's a small difference in the technique here. Uh, 
The idea is you start by building your magic data structure on the polynomial that you want to compress. And so this gives some memory representation, right? It gives some contents of the memory bits, S cells of W bits. And now, so the high level idea here, I'm going to be cheating a little bit with the math, but sort of the intuition should be clear. So now I just pick a random sample of these memory cells. Okay. So I include each of the cells with probability n over 4s. Okay. So I have some random sampling. I take each of them independently with probability n over 4s. I include this memory cell in my sample. So I get some subset of the cells, call it C. And now my encoding of this polynomial is just I write down this set C. Okay, that's my bit string encoding. And when I write it down, I take all the cells, I write the address and the contents of the cell. That's what I write down. So how much does this cost? Like in the expectations, so this is here where I'm cheating a bit because this is not a worst case thing and on the next slide there'll be other th things uh, affecting this. But eventually I had uh, SW, I have S cells, right? I sample each of them with probability n over 4s. When I want to write down one of them, the contents is w bits, the address is log s bits, and we assume that the word size is enough to hold an address, so it's at most two w bits to write down the contents and the address. Right? So of course I chose this n over 4s, so this is smaller than n log p, right? That's the whole idea, right? I get less than the number of bits I need if I wanted to represent every polynomial uniquely. Essentially, this is n log n bits, and p is n squared, so it, it has to take at least two n log n bits. So I'm below the sort of the number of bits needed uh, on average. Okay, so essentially now I just want to show that I can get the polynomial back from this encoding. This is the really simple encoding, right? Just pick some random cells, write them down. And so why would this work? And so the, the way that you recover or reconstruct your polynomial from this set of cells is quite simple. So you just take every possible query. So there's p different queries you could ask for this data structure problem. And for each of them, I just start running the query algorithm on this input. Okay, I just start running the query algorithm. The decoder starts running the query algorithm. And this query algorithm repeatedly requests the cell. And the idea is just if the cell is not in this sample that I wrote down, I just discard the query and move on to the next one. And if all of them are there, then I'll get the answer back, right? Because I can just run the entire query algorithm. So it's a very simple decoding algorithm. Just run all the queries. And so if I look at one of these queries, and look at the probability that I can actually run the simulation to the end, right? It reads t cells if the query time is t. Each of them is included in the sample independently with probability n over 4s. So I get the answer back with probability n over 4s to the t, right? That's the probability that I get this answer back to this one query that I'm simulating. And so, like, an expectation I'm going to recover. Essentially, there's p different queries. Each of them is being recovered with probability n over 4s to the t. So an expectation, I, I would see p is n squared. So I, want, I will see n squared times n over 4s to the t queries that will be recovered by this process in expectation. So this is, again, a place where I'm cheating a little bit. But. So this is what you will see. OK. So if the data structure was really fast, the time is little o of log n over log s over n. Right. So then, what is this n over 4s to the t? Let's just simplify as n over s to the little o of log n over log s over n. Right, this is 1 over n to the little o of 1. Right. Let me just move this up. Right, so. OK, is this clear? So. So that's the whole point, right? A, a query essentially survives with probability 1 over n to the little of 1 if I do this sampling. And I had n squared queries, so I expect n to the 2 minus little of 1 queries to survive this sampling, that I can still simulate the entire query algorithm afterwards. So, so essentially, we're, you know, you get essentially almost n squared points on the polynomial, and then you just do polynomial interpolation, and you get the polynomial back. Right? Is this clear enough? Right, so, 
All right, so P is uniquely determined from n plus one points. I have almost n squared. So that's the full proof. The assumption was false. I can get the polynomial back from less than n log p bits, basically. It's a very clean and simple proof for, for this concrete problem, right? Yes, Miguel? Yes. 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 So there are techniques where it can't be used. I think all the ones where you can use your technique with me, I, I guess not completely. Okay. So let me give you an example of a problem where you cannot actually use this technique. It's a little bit subtle. So so one thing here with this technique is, so it's, it's, it's getting a little bit technical, but. So, so let's define a non-deterministic data structure, okay? So a non-deterministic data structure is not something you can ever implement, but the idea is it can guess which memory cells it wants to read, okay? So let's say it, it, it doesn't have to decide which cells to read based on what it has seen, it just guesses magically T cells it wants to read and the answer should be fixed from these T cells. And if it does, and if you give it some set of, some different set of T cells, it should say this is not a proof of the answer, okay? So a non-deterministic data structure, this lower bound still works, this proof. Is this clear? So if I sample the T cells that serve as a certificate for the answer to this non-deterministic data structure, I can still get the answer out. So in some, even though non-deterministic data structures don't exist, the lower bound here will hold if the data structure is allowed non-determinism. And so, so let's look at a problem where, so let's look at predecessor search. So this is, uh, So here you're given a set of keys. So you're given n elements in some universe. Uh, let's call it u here. So you get some n integers, and you want to store them. And so then when you get a query q, which is also an integer, you, you should report uh, largest element smaller than or equal to, to q, right? So basically you can think of these elements as sitting on the, on the line. I give you a query q. You have to report this one here, the predecessor, okay? So for this problem, there's a low bound by uh, you and uh, Mihai where you prove for, for linear space data structures and near linear space, you need log log n. Uh, let's say u is say n squared and your space is like linear. And you need log log n time for this problem, okay? Um, and if you l look at the non-deterministic case, there's actually a a constant time solution for this problem. So you can, so constant time solution for this problem is to, memory representation is the sorted list <coughs> of these elements. So they're just stored sorted in an array of size n. So this is x i, x i plus one, they're sorted. And when I get a predecessor query for q, the non-deterministic data structure guesses these two cells, if q is sitting between these two, it guesses the predecessor and the successor and these, you can see that this is greater than, this is less than or equal to, it's actually a certificate that this is the predecessor, if you see these two things. So there's a constant time, non-intimistic data search for predecessor search. Uh, this cannot work for that problem, yes. But, but in that case, they're tight upper bounds that match. You couldn't possibly write in this case, or they're not, so you couldn't possibly prove that This lower bound using that technique, exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, just using any technique, you're not going to improve the bound, but here this technique cannot even prove this bound, right? Uh, this, yeah, this technique can only prove a constant bound for this problem. So sometimes you need different techniques. Uh, um, and that's essentially the, the rule of thumb would be for every problem where there's an efficient non-deterministic data structure, you cannot use this technique. Yeah? It's because uh, that bound is proved by Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's a different technique that I did not touch upon yet. It's more complicated than these simple techniques. Uh, in the sake of time, I did not look at this round elimination. Basically, the main idea in the proof of this lower bound is to show that every time I make a probe, I, can't, I don't know which cell is the right one to read. That's essentially how the lower bound goes. Uh, you can sort of use the fact that it doesn't know which cell to read 
uh, which the non-deterministic one always does. But that's sort of the idea. Yeah. You can. I think you can prove. There is a round elimination one from communication complexity. We can prove log log over log log log, or something like this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a. Yeah. There's different things with the universe size and. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the universe size has to be even bigger and. and there's some yeah, yeah, but it's definitely more technical. So, anyways, but it, it works for these problems that are also hard if it, in the non-deterministic case. So, it's a good thing to keep in mind if you want to prove lower bounds for problems that have an efficient non-deterministic data structure, but not uh, a normal efficient data structure. So, anyways, it's a side step. Uh, so that's sort of the timeline of these static lower bounds, and this is where we are. And which is, it's good for some problems, the lower bounds are tight. You can actually get the right lower bounds. But of course, there are many problems where we expect that the query time has to be like root n or something like this, right? So it's definitely not the right answer for all problems. But this is where we're stuck. Um, there's a long way to go. So uh, you can list those um, I can list the problem. So maybe what would be a good problem? Uh, so you preprocess a directed graph, maybe, and you can ask distance queries or something like this. I think that's one of the problems that take a long time, yeah. Um, another one is, yeah, maybe you receive them, you get a matrix, you want to pre-process, and then you can query with the vector, you want to compute m times v. That's also conjectured to take like n squared time. This is an n by n matrix, and this is an n vector. It's conjectured to take n squared time to compute this product. The highest lower bound we can prove is, is linear, essentially. That's if what? We can just even, so the conjecture says this is hard even for this Boolean matrix multiplication where we do and or uh, multiplication. So, so plus is replaced by or and multiplication is replaced by and. The conjecture says that computing this uh, MV takes like n squared time. And the highest low bound we can hope to prove with these techniques is uh, linear time uh, for this problem. So what's, oh, the M is static? Yes, M is static. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's lots of problems where we expect something much lower to be the right answer. Okay. Yeah. But luckily, at least the problems we could prove uh, lower bounds for, many of them is actually the right answer. So, so it's, it's not pointless, these lower bounds. Okay, so then let's move to these dynamic data structures where things are a little bit better, but not too much. Um, right, so this is the problem we had. We had we these employees we want to represent. We can add new employees and we can query for, let's say, so here the toy problem is this uh, hired owner before compute the salary expenses to all these people. This is also known as the prefix sum problem if we abstract away these uh, employees. So you just have an array of integers, you can change the integer stored in an entry, and then you can ask for the sum of everything up to i. Okay, so we can, this is the prefix sum problem. And clearly this is the same as this uh, employee's uh, setting. Okay. Right, so just to make sure everyone understands what the problem is, so we have this array A. If I ask for the prefix sum of the first three entries, the answer is 11. If I add then an update would maybe add two to the first entry, so now it stores to the value three. And the same query now has the answer 13, right? So you can change the data uh, as you move along. And we saw this solution with the binary tree in the beginning that had log in update time and log in query time uh, for this problem. Okay, so let's sort of look at the techniques that have been proposed for proving these dynamic lower bounds instead. Uh, so the first one from 1989, this is called the chronogram technique. And it could actually prove these log n over log log n lower bounds for the maximum of the update time and the query time. Uh, so let's have a look what the idea is here. So, uh, so the idea when you want to prove a lower bound for a data structure problem, you start by sort of fixing a hard uh, input distribution, which in this case would consist of a sequence of n random updates, okay? followed by one random query for some distribution on queries and updates that you think is hard. So in this case, it would be, you know, update entry x1 by the value delta 1, followed by update entry x2 by the value uh, delta 2, so forth. You have n of these updates. Then at the end, you ask for the prefix sum and some random prefix. That would be like a hard distribution for this problem. 
And so this would be, you know, you change this entry by delta one, you change this one by delta two, and so forth, and then you ask a query, you want to sum the things in there. So you could also think of it as like this, so you have time, like a time axis, each of these red dots is an update, and the query is here at the end. Okay. So when we want to prove lower bounds, we sort of divide this timeline into what we call epochs. Um, so you have log base beta of n epochs of size beta to the j, each of them. So we have exponentially increasing in size epochs. Okay. So epoch one is the one closest to the query, so it's closest to the present time. And when you go back in time, these epochs get bigger and bigger. Okay. And now the idea is see, that we want to sort of, uh, so when you look at the memory contents of the data structure at the time where you are answering the query. Okay. So it stores some, it has some cells, they have some bits. And once you run this update sequence, you take these cells and then you essentially color them or think of them as belonging to the epoch in which they were last updated. Okay. So let's say all these cells here, they were updated in epoch four, but not in three, two, and one. So then they will be colored with four or black in this case, right? So we color them based on when they were updated. There's some cells here that were maybe updated in epoch three, possibly also in epoch four, but not in two and one. Okay. So we just color them based on the last time they were changed. Okay. So this gives some coloring of your memory cells. Some of them are black, some of them are purple, some are blue, some are orange. Okay. And now what you want to show to prove a lower bound is that any data structure has to read, let's say, one cell of each color. Okay, that's sort of what you want to prove. And so it has to read one of these black cells, it has to read a blue cell, it has to read a purple cell, and an orange cell. That's what you want to show. And of course, since there's log base beta of n different colors, you'll get a log base beta of n lower bound out of this. Right? So this is sort of how a proof would go. We want to prove this type of theorem that you have to read a cell from each of these colors. Okay. So let's just uh, get a little bit of intuition about why that would be true for this prefix sum problem, that you have to read uh, something of every color. Okay. I'll not do the full proof here because the last technique we'll see sort of has some parts of this idea in it, so, so we'll see it later. But the intuition for why you would have to read something in there. Okay. So the first idea, observation is, Everything that happens in the larger epochs, right, all the ones that are larger than the one you're trying to prove a lower bound for, they happened in the past. Right? They happened, essentially all this was executed before seeing these updates. So if the updates are independent of each other, anything you write over here cannot really say anything about what's going on in here. right? When you wrote this stuff to memory, you didn't know what epoch three was doing. So that's sort of the intuition, right? Everything that was written in the past doesn't help you. Okay, so what about all the stuff that's written in the future? So all these smaller epochs. So we set beta fairly large. Say the update time times the word size squared, let's say. Then how many cells are stored in here? Right, so because they go down exponentially, essentially the epoch just before is going to dominate the number of cells. Right? So let's look. So, so since the number of cells would be right, sum over uh, i less than j. So the ith epoch had this beta to the i updates, and the update time was tu, right? the worst case update time. So it writes at most this many cells. Right? So this is basically beta to the j minus one to you, right, for beta big enough. So this is not too big, and it's like effects, almost effects a beta smaller. And even if I write down, if I look at how many bits are stored in these cells in total, I get another w factor here. This is the number of bits stored in all these memory cells. Now beta went down by a factor w tu squared. Right, so this is something like beta to the j over tuw. Right. 
So there's way fewer bits in all these future cells than the number of updates in Epoch J. So in some sense, if Epoch J consists of random updates, even if we read everything that happened in the future, Epoch J is still mostly unknown, right? It would be essentially unknown to you. Because uh, there's just not enough information in, in what's going on in the future to, to say anything useful. So it's essentially, yeah, so this blue thing is much bigger than all of the future. And so this is almost unknown. And this consisted of random updates at random array entries. And the query is at some uniform random place. So you, know, you expect that you're going to have to read at least one memory cell to figure out what happened in, in this epoch. That's sort of the intuition for the proof. Right. So this is big enough. And, and OK, so essentially the limitation of this technique is that you, you need all these future epochs to be sufficiently small compared to this epoch. You can write down all the contents and, and addresses. So. So beta has to be at least this w to u to some constant. So the lower bound will never be more than, the number of epochs will be log in or log w to u. That will be the number of epochs. Right, so, so essentially the query time is at least log in over log, word size, update time. This is never better than log in over log log in because of this word size in there. Well, now the upper bound for this problem had a log in and not a log in over log log in. So this technique cannot really prove the tight uh, lower bound for this concrete problem. And so that brings us to the next sort of technique. Let's see how we're doing on time. Yeah, this is good. Which is by Petrascu and Domain from uh, 2004. So it took like 15 years to move from this login over log login to, to a login. So the progress is slow, but uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. Oh, we're not very strong at what we're doing. But anyway, so this is Mihai, it was quite impressive. Mihai Petrasco is, uh, you probably saw his name already a few times if you don't know him. Uh, very strong uh, PhD student that sadly passed away way too young, but um, here he is. And what his first result as an undergrad uh, proved this log and lower bound after 15 years of no progress. And maybe you could also notice that he's the non-alphabetic first order, uh, first author on this paper, even though that's not common for the TCS papers. You always do alphabetic by last name. So he's really, uh, yeah, he was really smart here. Yeah. So anyway, so his low bound shows that this binary tree solution is optimal. Uh, he also proved low bound for all trade-offs between the query time and update time that are also tight. Yeah. So his technique, and I think you'll see more about this technique in uh, Raphael's talk. So we'll just sort of go quickly over it here. So to prove the low bound for this prefix sums problem, instead of considering one query at the end, a bunch of updates in the middle, consider some sequence of mixed queries and updates. And the updates are again at random locations to with random values that you add. And again, the queries are again at uniform random locations. So it's the same hard distribution, but except that you do queries uh, all the time intermixed with the updates. Yeah, so compute these prefix sums. So let's look at this in a slightly different way. So we have this array, and now, oh, this is weird on this computer. Okay, let's see how it goes. So let's say your first update, you add something to this entry, you have time upwards, and maybe you query at this entry. So then essentially what you have to report is the sum, when you get this query, it's the sum of all the red things in here. Now, you get another uh, update to this location, possibly. Maybe you get a query over here. So the output to this query is basically the sum of all the red things down here, right? So this, you think of it, when I get this query, I have to output everything that happened up to this point in time. And it's the prefix sums, right? So it has to be everything to the left of this location. So if you look at it like this, you get these uh, simply dominance queries to report the sum of everything that's dominated by this query in time and in uh, array entry. Oh, this looked better on my machine. I'm sorry. I hope you, can, you get the idea. So you get a bunch of queries, uh, a bunch of updates, and yeah, each of them report the sum of everything in the lower left uh, region. Okay. And so what he does is essentially you, you look at this, you split 
your update and queries in time. So you sort of fix the middle uh, time event and split the update sequence in two halves. And the question that Mihaya asked is how much information has to be transferred from the updates that are happening down here to the queries that are being asked up here. Okay. So that's sort of the question he asked. How much information has to move across this, let's say, time barrier, you could say. Um, okay, so the observation that he had is, so he defines an interleave. So an interleave is, I move from left to right. Whenever I change from, when I see an update below, then a query above, then an update below, then a query above, an update below. That's an interleave every time I change from an, an update below to a query above, or from a query above to an update below. So let's just see here. So this is an interleave. First, I have, I have a, up, an update below, I get a query above, and I get an update below the line, a query above, an update below, a query above, and so forth. So you look at all these interleaves. Now the observation that he has is that the answer to a query, if I look at this query up here, even if I condition on the answers to all the other queries in this interleaf sequence that I have, the entropy of this output that you're going to report here has omega w bits in it, right? The entropy is omega w bits because I have this update down here that adds essentially a w bit number, right? And, this, and you know, even if I condition on all these numbers, the output is still unknown, right? If I condition on all these answers, right? So essentially, right, so the, let's see if I have something to erase with. So, so essentially, like the entropy of the ith query, even conditioned on, so this is the output of the ith query, let's say, conditioned on the outputs to these other queries is omega w, right? So, and you know, it's by the chain rule of uh, entropy, right, the entropy of all the outputs of these queries in this interleave sequence is omega k w, right? So in some sense, okay, and so, okay, so this next question is how many interleaves do I have? When I put things randomly, I'm going to have a linear number of interleaves uh, in, in expectation. So essentially, the entropy of all these answers above will be NW bits, or you need NW bits of information coming from below the timeline to above. So, so there's some amount of information that's being transferred there. So that basically means that so the intuition is that all the queries that I'm asking up here, since each memory cell they read has W bits, it's going to they're going to have to read omega n cells that were written by the updates in the blue half of the time interval, right? That's sort of the in intuition that we're using here. So you need to read a linear number of cells from below the line when you're answering the queries above the, the timeline. Okay, so there's a linear number of, of memory reads that are going on. And so now what you do now is, so you basically recurse on the two halves. So this is uh, the, the top half of the uh, time interval. You cut it in half. And you ask the same question, you look at all the interleaves. And so, writing omega n half, which is a little bit ugly. So essentially you have n half re memory reads that are going on that were written in the, this blue region and red in this purple region. And you can do the same argument on the other side. There's again n half uh, reads that are going on. And so the observation is that you're not overcounting uh, when you're doing this trick. So you're not counting the same read twice. Okay? It's basically because, so the reads that are being done up here to something that was written down here, it's not the same, when I'm, I'm reading something here that, right, it's not the same read operation. Right? It's happening in a different bunch of time. And that's sort of, the, the observation is you can sum up all these reads, that the take home message. And you can keep doing this all the way down the tree. <coughs> and of course this tree has depth log n. So the lower bound becomes n log n reads in total. Right. And you had n sequences, so that's log n per, per operation that you're doing. Okay, so that's sort of the, the idea of the technique. And, right. So let's see how, uh, just to keep track of time. 
I think actually this is, okay, the three minutes to the break was scheduled. I think this is a good time to take the, the last coffee break. Right? Yeah. And we'll move on afterwards. Yeah.